This topology gives you a sense of how the lab environment is constructed. It's broken into three main sections. We have a data center area where we have the standard edition SD-WAN appliance acting as a master control node. So it's responsible for configuration and works as the hub in the hub and spoke environment. Um, we also have a WAN optimizer, which will be intercepting traffic coming out of our uh, data center simulation server. We also have a BGP router, which will be providing BGP peering into the SD-WAN appliance. In the center, we have our WARAN environment with an MPLS and internet router connecting to the branch office, but we also have a WAN emulation platform that allows us to interact with the circuits, create loss, latency, and delay. In the branch office, there is an SD-WAN appliance in client mode, and this will be providing virtual path connectivity to the MCN appliance. Um, we also have another SD-WAN uh, WAN op device which will be uh, uncompressing the information from the data center and intercepting traffic from the Windows 10 host down here, which will be providing all the client access. Uh, we also have an OSPF router to demonstrate OSPF routing capabilities of our SD-WAN appliance. So SD-WAN uh, is built from a number of network paths. Uh, and right now we have operational, uh, an MPLS connection between a data center and a branch. This can be seen here on paths one and two and five and six. So these represent the unidirectional paths that exist between the two locations. Uh, and in this case, this is an MPLS circuit uh, running at two megabits per second. And 50% of the bandwidth has been allocated to the default queue. And the other 50% has been allocated to expedited forwarding. So MPLS is used uh, by its queues rather than the whole circuit path. So what we're able to do is utilize those queues regardless of what traffic we put into them to maximize performance. So in this particular case, what we'll see is traffic using both queues simultaneously rather than being stuck in a single queue if each queue offers a better path. So let's start downloading files. This is a Windows simulation client. So uh, we have a web browser on here and we can access uh, the uh, network file server, uh, which also has a web browser, a web server built into it. So uh, we're going to start downloading this 800 meg file. And uh, when we start downloading that file, you can see it's arriving. So if we go to downloads, uh, you can see um, this file is downloading from uh, the web server. And if we go over to the uh, SD-WAN paths, you can now see that traffic using the, both the queues inside the MPLS circuit. If we look at uh, the WAN optimizer, you can see it's identified that this traffic needs to go through uh, the network. And if we hit refresh, there was a little burst of pre-understood data. And now we're back at around uh, 2.3 megabits per second, which is just under where we're going to be running over this two meg MPLS WAN link. So you can see that the actual uh, WAN traffic is around 1.5 megabits per second. Uh, so the download is running at around 200 kilobits per second. Uh, and we're load sharing that over two different queues. Now, you may have noticed when we were looking at the MCN node that we have this internet connection in a dead state. Uh, now, if we were to introduce this uh, connection, we can turn off the packet loss on that link to allow it to be added into the network. Um, the circuit will go through what's called a bad state. So it's now noted that there are packets getting through the link and there is some packet loss being detected. Uh, and it will test that connection to prove that it's good. Uh, and once it believes it's good and it can be used, then that circuit will be used and bound into the traffic. And you will see that bandwidth being added in now. So what's happened for the user's perspective is the service is still the same, uh, but actually we've now managed to increase the bandwidth for the user. And this is purely by adding new circuits. The, the user is unaware of that. So uh, if you imagine you had your flow being pinned to a specific link and other flows being moved onto other links, um, you wouldn't have seen an improvement in this particular user's service. However, we are load sharing packets, uh, which is a really particular feature of the Citrix SD-WAN, uh, which allows us to use all of the available bandwidth to the best possibility. Uh, by changing rules within our configuration, you can either persist connections against 
balance links if that's what you require, or you can load balance our traffic across the multiple connections. And in some instances, if you've got things like voice over IP or HDX, you may want to send it down two paths at the same time to ensure 100% reliability. That can also be configured too. Uh, so that's adding a new circuit into the network. So what happens if we want to uh, simulate a failure? So we'll fail the MPLS connection uh, to see what happens there by going into the MPLS connection, which is interfaces one and two. We are then able to increase the packet loss to a full loss. And you will see here that that service is now going down. So we've got 100% packet loss in one direction. Uh, which means it's going to bring down that connection and we're still sending data on this here so the flow hasn't had to redirect from to a different link or cause any problems it has continued and just adjusted to the new available bandwidth now this means that uh, a flow that originally started on the mpls connection um, has now been merged into the internet connection as well so we saw that massive bandwidth improvement and its original circuit has now gone into failure so in a, in a situation where you have catastrophic network events, uh, you were then able to ensure network traffic works fine. Um, and also that if you need to take a particular circuit out for maintenance, uh, you can do so without impacting your users. Uh, and they may be able to take over and use backup circuits if they are present at that location. Um, if this circuit is restored to a point where uh, some of the connectivity is available, but there is still a fault in the network, so if we'll put that to 70% packet loss, um, we will then start testing the circuit and you'll see that it will start checking using its polling techniques to understand 70, 67, very close to 70% there you see, so it now knows the type of loss, um, but it won't restore that connection back in unless it is absolutely the last path available. Uh, so you can continue to say, you know, this circuit is not working as expected and report that back out to your service provider for investigation and te further testing uh, and give you that assurance that when you do get a 100% working circuit, you can provide it back to your users. So let's restore that back to uh, zero loss. And as that circuit comes back into service, I'll just put the uh, web browser up there you are now able to see that that bandwidth is going to increase as we start loading traffic back into that connection. Okay, so we've been downloading this file for a while and you can see we're probably around 15 or so percent. Uh, and if you look inside of our uh, WAN optimizer, the WAN optimizer has detected the change in bandwidth and I can see that that's now bits of traffic that it may have seen before passing by have been accelerated where possible. Uh, but more importantly, you can see the WAN connection has gone from three megabits, which is what the internet connection is. And those extra two megabits have now been added in the throughput. So all being conditioned and streamlined by our WAN optimizer. So let's cancel this download. So clean that up. Um, the same file is also available via a network share. So we want to do a SIPS download. So we can go into our uh, network server and we can download the same 800 megabit file. And what you'll see is the way that WAN Optimizer has already seen some of this traffic. So we're downloading this at 33 megabits, megabytes per second, uh, and then back to uh, 35 kilobytes, which is data that is now cold. So this has been downloaded via the HTTP protocol before, um, but we're, not, we're now doing it via SIF. So uh, it does go to show that when you're using our product, uh, it doesn't matter what the flow is. It's more the content of the packet that's passing by that's recorded rather than uh, the actual protocol. So the WAN optimizer intercepted the SIFS connection, uh, then started talking to the um, network file share, and we were able to download this connection at 237.5 megabits per second. Uh, but when you actually look at the WAN bandwidth that was being used, it was next to nominal because we're sending signatures for this repeatable traffic. Um, 
And when we run out of data that we have seen, uh, we return to 4.3 megabits per second out of the server. Uh, and you can see that the actual throughput has now been uh, restored across the WAN. So we got a huge benefit there by WAN optimization over SD-WAN. So remember, you can use the two together, uh, WAN optimizer, uh, deduplicating and compressing traffic across the network, and then SD-WAN standard edition, uh, aggregating multiple circuits for resilience and uh, maximum throughput. Uh, if you look inside of um, the connections, we can see that SIFS connection reporting uh, and the percentage of bandwidth savings we received while transferring it through that warm data uh, and as it moved into cold. And what's important is that you can also see here the partner unit that it was sending to. So uh, 242 is uh, this device, which is also seeing the other side of the connection. So this is where the cold data would have then been, sorry, the um, warm data would have then been uh, exploded into real data and sent onto the um, Windows host. <laughs> 